So thank you everybody for coming back for the third session of today's qualitative research uh, webinar. We are so thrilled this morning went wonderfully and I am absolutely sure that we will have three more discussions that are uh, equally interesting and uh, hopefully all of you will find it as interesting again. These again, like everything else, has often had connections with, with things I find interesting. So there's always been an autoethnographic component to the uh, contributions. My colleagues uh, from, from the School of Nursing, Psychotherapy and Community Health are presenting this afternoon with me and um, on topics that, again, I find very interesting. And we'll start with Ray's work and uh, I, I've met and worked with Ray in the ethics uh, uh, board or group uh, committee, and that's where we first met each other. And I found his research incredibly interesting as somebody who actually has written about similar topics from the 18th century. And so I was so thrilled when he agreed to come and speak here. So, um, so Ray is in our um, psychotherapy program. And uh, it, this, I believe, is based on his PhD work originally, um, of, of which I've read. And anybody who's interested for more information, I'm sure you can look at it too. And hopefully we'll see a book come out of this, <laughs> you know? So I'm, a, I'm asking all of you to write books. This is <laughs> wonderful. So, um, but I will, without further notice, turn it over to Ray, whose uh, title is Analyzing Homosexual Discourse, a discourse analysis on the love that dare to speak its name. So Ray, you can share your, your, um, your slides and- Okay, thank you for that. And just to check, is that yeah, showing no, okay to everyone? No problem. Yeah, if you no want problem. to go full, full screen there, uh, Ray, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And we can hear you, no problem. Great. Um, so thank you very much, Tanya. Thank you for this opportunity to <laughs> go down Amnesia Avenue and remind myself what once I thought and why I thought it was so important. Um, so basically, as, as Tony said, my name is Ray O'Neill. I'm with the psychotherapy team as part of the School of Nursing, Psychotherapy and Community Health. I'm going to come out at the beginning because I just think it's really, in case it isn't glaringly obvious, I am actually a psychoanalyst. And so therefore, analysis and language have been the cornerstone of my clinical practice and my research work uh, for more years than I care to remember, I think is the safe thing to borrow Mr. Brennan's line. And basically when it came to doing my PhD originally, which I did through DCU and, and really, really had a, an incredible um, time uh, being supported and being encouraged because anyone who has done this work knows just how long and how demanding it, it can be, particularly as life keeps turning and whirling. When I originally started doing the work, my original thesis proposal because I'm interested um, working as a sexual advocate and working around sex positivity. Um, I was looking at, at, I suppose, particularly sexual behaviors between gay men and how gay men were increasingly being influenced by pornography in terms of what they did, how they treated each other, how they saw each other, their expectations, and the blurring of that line between fantasy and reality becoming more and more, um, or less and less distinct, I should say. Um, and obviously this is something that is now happening across the world when we see, I suppose, the pornification in media, the pornification of dating apps and where you have to advertise your sex appeal, your body, rather than talking about sex and sexuality in a different time. So originally my PhD, what I hoped to do was to interview gay men who were born blind, to have speak with them about what their experiences of desire, how they experience their sexuality. Well, when I got through the, the joy that is ethics um, and began to do my interviews, what 
actually emerged was I had this fantasy that they would be free from the visual having been blind from birth and they wouldn't be caught up in these kind of visual signifiers of what makes a man desirable, what makes a man a man, what makes a gay man uh, popular or desired. But they, they spoke about it's really important what a man looks like, how a man looks, a man has to look masculine. And I was, I was just so thrown by this repeated phrase, how he looks, it's really important that he looks butch or that he looks masculine. And if he looks effeminate in any way, then no, I would have nothing to do with him. And so I went back and kind of went, what is this obsession with gender? What is this obsession with ridiculing um, and despising effeminacy, which to me is, is so close to anti-woman um, and internalized homophobia? And what is it we're doing? <laughs> How did it get this far? And that's, I suppose, where discourse analysis became the qualitative methodology that I suppose appealed to me because like I say, I am a psychoanalyst and I operate around language all the time, but also in terms of getting some potential understandings of how things emerge, not why things emerge, because we can never be definite, but how things emerge. And that's where I'm going to start if it's okay with our friend or not friend, Matt Hancock, interesting name, but I won't go on about that because that's glaringly obvious. And how Hancock got into trouble not for cheating on his wife of, I think, 15 years, not for, a, you know, breaking potentially a family with three children, not for the nepotism of giving a friend and lover or kissing partner, I'm not sure what term we would use, none, for none of these reasons, for did he have to resign, for nepotism, for, for dishonesty, for deception, it was for breaking COVID rules. And to me, this is a great... Um, a great discourse analysis moment where, you know, where the problem is and what people apologize or don't apologize for or resign for shifts and changes. And so this was just a really interesting moment to me about how the discourses are shifting. And this is, I suppose, language never has a fixed meaning. Language is constantly evolving, devolving, shifting and changing. Even when I unconsciously use the word shifting, Working with young, when I was a, a young lad, shifting meant one specific type of thing. French kissing in the USA, as Debbie Harry taught me. Whereas the younger folk, and by younger folk, probably anyone under 30, doesn't use that word anymore. And so the language around, particularly for me, sex and sexuality is constantly shifting and changing. And there's huge power in who decides or how these things are decided. And again, it's not like there's a puppet master that's deciding everything, like the Big Brother in 1984, which is a book I'll be referring to quite a lot. It's, it's collective decisions or what is promoted or what is most visible that tends to decide things. And that's why we talk about discourse rather than language, because discourse isn't just words, it's anything that signifies. So indeed, images and images are all important in this day and age. Again, as I said, COVID has just been such a powerful time for discourse shifting and changing. I mean, I really, I, I, it may surprise you, I'm not a huge fan of Leo Varadkar, i.e. I'm not a Fine Gael voter, but um, I, I kind of gave him or his, the people behind him kudos when they started talking about cocoons 15 months ago. Now, 15 months of being in my cocoon, I'm a bit tired of cocooning, and I'm not looking forward to the threats of more cocoons. But it was a great discourse to use because of the promise. It offered safety in the short term, an emergence of something beautiful, even if you are a mot. You could be a beautiful butterfly on the other side. So it's very interesting language. And again, social distancing, who's in your bubble, lockdown, remote work. But what was interesting, I suppose, for me was the coupleism that was behind so much. And this is again where a discourse analysis would look at these things and kind of go, well, what actually is being said here? And what was being said was that only people in couples or family units are going to be happy during these lockdowns. And as for the single people, well, it's all your fault. I remember a client of mine saying after, I think I can't remember which lockdown it was, when Leo Varadkar said, so if you can find people to get into your bubble and then you can have a bubble, I think it was in the second lockdown, and the client just turned around, I've spent the last 18 years looking for someone to share a bubble and now Leah Varadkar thinks I'm going to do it in 26 hours. So again, 
to analyze, to be aware that everything we say always says more. And this is where I find the film V for Vendetta very powerful because it, uh, written in the original graphic novel written in 1984 against Thatcherite Britain explores the use of language and how power is achieved through language. And we only have to look at what's happened, particularly with Brexit and with Donald Trump to see how if you use the right words, you can achieve a very important aim. Again, why, this, uh, why I think my thesis is still relevant and important is because when you watch what's happening across the world, what language people uses is an indicator of what way winds are blowing. And sometimes in Ireland, because particularly of marriage equality and, and what a watershed powerful and very emotional moment that was, though again, it did advocate coupleism, um, we can forget that in other parts of the world, here in Europe, other things are happening for other people. So that the Czech president come out and can call people, transgender folk, disgusting. That Poland has advocated LGBT free zones. And that Hungary has approved a law banning LGBT material to minors, which includes anything on the television that promotes any kind of, or shows any kind of positive image of same-sex lives, of same-sex couples, of same-sex relationships. The word homosexual, which is kind of the focus of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about discourse analysis, and if I have time, I'll quickly talk a little bit about what my thesis did in terms of a discourse analysis. The word homosexual is itself homophobic. It is a medicalized word that comes with a long history of reducing people to uh, a medical insane or pathologically perverse category, and it limits them to being defined as homogenous, homo, and sexual. So they're not allowed to be amorous, they're not allowed to be loving, they're only allowed to be genitally sexual. And that definition is something that a lot of same-sex men in particular have stayed stuck in or constructed by. And so for me, there was some irony in Arlene Foster claiming that she isn't homophobic because she, and yet she talks about having many friends who are homosexual. Anyone who says they have many friends who are anything or as a defense against a potential marginalized group, I always kind of squirm a little bit at that, but calling people who are gay or same-sex attracted as homosexual, we've moved on hopefully from that discourse. And that's why what's happening in Poland and Hungary or indeed in Northern Ireland is important to keep in mind. Those of you that have watched The Handmaid's Tale, again, very powerful about how Gilead does what it does. And ultimately it moves against women, but not before reinforcing absolute gender stereotypes. There is man and man is allowed to do these things. And there is women who are not allowed to do these things. And so anyone who occupied a non-productive zone was called a gender traitor. And that's why homosexuality is always wrapped up in gender questions, issues around how much of a man you are, how much of a woman you are, whether you're gay or lesbian. If there was a theme song for discourse analysis, which I won't put us through just now, but it is that old song about it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. And that's what a discourse analysis looks at. How do things become true? As Winston Smith says in 1984, I understand how, I don't understand why. Discourse analysis comes from Foucault and it's an analysis that always evades or tries to, to not specifically answer questions, but keep asking questions. And indeed, that's what a psychoanalysis in many ways does. By asking questions, we're keeping the conversation open. When we answer a question, the risk is we potentially close the conversation. So this idea of human beings being constructionist, that we are constructed, that everything about our identity, everything that we say is embedded in language or discourses or signifiers or images, that we were born into. So nothing can be taken for granted. And so what a post-structuralist thing doesn't just look at the text 
whether it's a human being, whether it's a body, whether it's an image, whether it's a film, whether it's um, a, an article, it looks at how were, was the author or the creator or the subject able to do this, enact this, perform this. And so our attention goes rather, for, instead of going to the world, it goes to the word, to look at how things are produced both consciously and of course, again, from my point of view as a psychoanalyst, unconsciously. Nobody hands you a book around how to be gay or how to be homosexual. In fact, you're more likely to be how not to be or to make sure that you were, and certainly in the Ireland and the world that I grew up on. But you pick up things all the time. So even as a teenage boy, when I, there was obviously things that were happening to me around my desire, I remember logically saying to myself, well, I can't be gay because I like my penis because I had picked up or that something around my masculinity was going to be lost if I became gay, or that maybe I was a man trapped in a woman's body, et cetera. And these are all old discourses that I went in to kind of explore. And that's why kind of going back to the 19th century, looking at the different terms, and there's just a range of the terms, but homosexual was the one that came to dominate. And what does homo mean? Homo is around sameness and therefore connects into mirrors and narcissism. So part of my PhD was looking at kind of the history of mirrors and mirrors as a technology and how in the 19th century, mirrors became affordable luxury goods as against luxury goods, which they had, had existed since the middle ages. Regular folk could access mirrors. So in many ways, mirrors became the internet of the day. It gave people access to their own image. And if you were too interested in your own image, then there might be a problem. Also, homonotness comes from the Latin sense of man, homo. And again, so masculinity, one's maleness is implicated. And as I said earlier, by calling it sexual, it limits the desire to a sexual and therefore to a genital and therefore potentially to an unproductive. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to skip ahead, if I may. There's some of the things that in my kind of discourse analysis, the first kind of layers of things that I looked at coming from stuff I was reading, coming from the interviews in particular that I did and working around LGBT sexuality uh, for 20 years that there are questions and all of them relate. And this is the thing about discourse analysis. It's never A equals B equals C. A influences C, which influences F, which influences A, which creates Z, which creates four. There's always these things are intermingling within each other. And so some of the things that I focused on, I suppose, is the binary opposition. This myth that there are two sexes, a man and a woman. And what a man is, is completely the opposite of what a woman is, which is an incredibly Gilead way of restricting women's freedoms and movements and paradoxically men's freedoms and movements. Both men obviously get to enjoy different, um, uh, sorry, a whole set of privileges. And so this idea of the rhizome is important in discourse analysis, that rather this tree, we kind of see the image that the roots cause the branches, and this is what formed and this is what happened. The rhizomic image is that the roots are all interconnected, and we can never be quite sure what will sprout and where they'll sprout. And this, again, is what a discourse analysis will do. So, for example, there's an emerging group in the US and perhaps elsewhere called the Transabled Community. And what the transabled community do is they're using the la language of transgenderism. These are able-bodied people. So people who have fully functioning, I don't know if that's the right word, but excuse me if that was the wrong word, uh, bodies. But they believe that really that they are disabled, that even though they have proper sight, that they are blind or should be blind. Um, psychically, they should be disabled. It depends, a whole range of disabilities, which they do not have but feel that they have the right to either have access to the benefits of or to enact on their bodies. And so this blurs, it uses the transgender language to do something else. And this is the danger with discourse. So some part of me can see the alarm and appreciate the alarm that people have around uh, gender discourses, particularly transgender discourses. But this is the thing with discourse. 
it creates more discourse. We cannot decide whether it's positive or negative. All we should do is keep questioning, keep engaging. The key point that happened at the end of the 19th century is that homosexuality produced a visibility. It became a word and very much Freudian psychoanalysis propagated this word. Interestingly, before the, homo uh, the homosexual existed before the heterosexual. So the homosexual emerged in the late 1860s. The heterosexual only emerged in the late 1880s. And it was actually Freud's thesis su supervisor that actually uh, propagated, I can't say he created the word, but certainly propagated, uh, Kraft Ebbing was his name, in a book he uh, called Psychopathia Sexualis, which again was hugely influenced influencing on Freud in terms of Freud's questions around gender and sexuality, but again, immersed in the language of the time. Another, and this is, I suppose, what is really surprising when you do a discourse analysis is you should kind of go in not knowing what you're going to find. It's always a much more exciting adventure if you don't know where you're going. Those days in the car when you were told you're going to British Bay, you were like, okay, we're going to British Bay. A surprise from Santee was always much more interesting. I mean, probably disappointing. I grew up in the 70s. But a surprise is always more curious and more adventurous. And that's what a discourse analysis. So I was surprised that one of my chapters was devoted to Oscar Wilde and looking to how Oscar Wilde embodied homosexuality, looking at the newspapers of the time throughout Europe and in the US about how the Oscar Wilde trials were reported and what was said and what wasn't said. Because after Oscar, everyone knew what a homosexual looked like and he looked like Oscar Wilde. And this was ironic because prior to the trials, Oscar Wilde was seen as a dangerous heterosexual man. So women had to be careful. And indeed, there's a famous painting which shows Oscar Wilde surrounded by women. And this was written or painted as a warning for the corruption that Oscar Wilde was having in seducing women with his words and with his thoughts. I'm conscious about time. So what I'm going to do is just pause for there so that if there may be any a pause on the presentation, which I will send on to Tanya and Justin, that if anyone would like the presentation and to read it, um, to feel free, it certainly might be a lot more accessible than the thesis, just to say. Thank you. Oh, great, Ray. That's wonderful. That's really, it's perfect. We, we actually had some questions in the chat box already, so this is wonderful. And I, I actually, I, I find this fascinating and really interesting because my work is actually in the 18th century. So people like Lacure's uh, two sex models are part of what I've tried to think about. And of course, the term at the time was sodomite for men and women had no term because we had no sexuality whatsoever. And so sleeping, but sleeping together with same sex partners was the norm. So everyone slept with someone of the same sex. It was we just didn't talk about what happened when they were sleeping as well. So um, any, anyway, we have some, we have a bunch of questions. I have a bunch of questions. So let's ask a, a couple of them. The first one is from um, uh, John. Uh, I can't see his last, last name here, but uh, they, they ask, um, the terminology is so interesting and embedded in some current nursing discourses. So this is someone studying nursing and they were talking about sex and gender and nursing um, and how that becomes part of care. Can you maybe comment on any of that? Well, again, it's, I suppose, like I said, discourse creates discourse and it's never about getting something right. It's just about trying our best. That's all we can ever do because the language that I used 10 years ago, which I thought was good language, it, you know, has shifted and changed and wouldn't be considered, you know, best appropriate language. And so I hate using this phrase because it just reminds me of the Ireland I came from, but the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think that's the important thing. Like if someone is, is masking, genuinely masking something as genuine concern, or a debate, but they're actually not interested in either concern, genuineness, or a debate, 
then there is an issue because something, someone is being silenced, something is being silenced. But if someone is well intentioned, but you know, believes that they're doing something well or trying to do so well, it's a way, it's a matter of, of, of opening it up because the worst thing you can do is shut people down by shame and just saying, you know, you're mm -hmm. ignorant, you're stupid, that's not politically correct, you're a homophobe, you know, you're a bigot, whatever. That doesn't move the debate on, that just shuts people down and creates enmity. And it should all be about alliances, in my opinion. I think that's very interesting and important too, in terms of thinking about emotions as part of this as well, because this is also taking emotion with the language, I think is part of that. And um, who owns that emotion with things? One of the examples you gave, um, we were, I forget which place it was, but when they used the acronyms LBG, uh, they left out the Q. And I thought, so that means queer people are welcome. So, <laughs> and it became, it, I'm being facetious, but uh, it's, it's a matter of not even acknowledging that as a component. So um, your point about making things less visible become part of this too. So I, which I think is so important. Um, it's, the additional point that I wanted to ask in terms of discourse analysis, there's a long tradition in sociology of working with psychotherapy. And so, um, and many gender theorists in particular, I'm thinking of Nancy Chattero. And uh, Nancy has a new book out this year called uh, Seeing with Sociological Eyes and Hearing with Psychotherapy Ears. <laughs> and I, I think it is a marriage that is something, I love Nancy's work. And um, so I, but uh, what I was, uh, thinking about was a more sociological component. You talk about constructionism and some of that, but some of the other social dynamics, is that part of what you're, you talked about gender a bit more? Are there uh, other? Absolutely. So again, like, because I obviously teach um, in the psychotherapy program and teach trainee uh, psychotherapists and psychotherapists who are going um, for a doctorate level in terms of their own research. And absolutely having a sociological eye, I love the title of the book, that will stay with me, having a sociologist eye, because yes, we work with human beings, but those human beings are subjects to the society that not only created them, but the set, their set of experiences. So one of the complaints, and this may sound facetious, but Tanya, it's okay if we're facetious, because sometimes facetiousness is all we know. But I know someone, often a client will come into me and they'll say, oh, this is such a first world problem. And I'll say, yes, because we live in the first world. If you had a third world problem, then we'd be having a whole other set of conversations. So obviously things like class, wealth, gender, race, all of these things, housing, um, age, all of these things feature and have to feature because no two clients are the same. No two lesbian um women of African origin living in Dundalk with a disability are the same. And so the, one of the things is, uh, the challenges for psychotherapy is to apply these kind of general principles and meet the client in the room. And when you're meeting the client, you're meeting their world, their society, where they come from. I think this is a wonderful point in terms of Ireland as well, where in the UK and Ireland where sociological eyes have taken a negative sort of bend and psycho, psychotherapy is taken a more positive. So you can have the ear, but not the eye anymore. And trying to recognize those multi-layer components is some of the, some of the wonderful things that date back to uh, early sociological components of which uh, George Herbert Mead's work on language from the very beginning was part of this. So, uh, so that's why this has been so wonderful. Ray, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. As Justin pointed out, we can make the uh, PowerPoints available to anyone. You can either get in contact with myself. We're all in the school, so you'll be able to talk to us all. 
if this was our normal feature, we'd be working with everybody much closer. And so we have made ourselves more available in the future for anybody who wants to continue talking because there is, there is so much we could talk about with every, every topic. So thank you so much, Ray. So thank you, Tanya. Thank you, everybody.